guys, welcome to Bar Z. My name's Stan, and it's time for another episode of The Grind. This is The Grind number 49, and it's time to unload the Dropbox again. This is what prompts me to do these episodes. When I clean out my Dropbox, I look back over the past month or two, and all the pictures I've taken, and it compels me to do this. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, first thing I posted on Instagram, was something that was given to me at the bash, uh, hand painted by Miss Emma Ritson. Take a look. Thank you, Emma. A wonderful piece, and uh, that's its permanent location in my shop. Um, very nice uh, piece of artwork there. Very durable too. It's all done with one shot. Uh, lettering paint. So thank you again. Uh, next up it was another item that was given to me at the bash made by Mr. Craig Campbell or at uh, MC Engineering. Um, it was kind of a steam whistle and it was his entry into uh, one of the American Rotary contests. Uh, but now it's got a permanent home and uh, let's go put an ear on it and see what it sounds like. So kind of an old-fashioned steam whistle, pretty cool. And it's the kind of steam whistle that makes you jump. Uh, kind of like going into one of Emma's uh, videos that uh, I always have my headphones on and I, she catches me every time on her way into the videos. It always makes me jump. So thanks for that, Craig. Um, and it's, gonna, it's got a permanent home there on the shop. Um, next up, we had a, a job at a plating line. Uh, now, th this was a, a chrome plating line for landing gear on aircraft. And, uh, you know, the aerospace companies, they got money. So let's go take a look at their line real quick. Okay, so that's all C, PVC ductwork. A lot of stainless, a lot of plastic. Uh, my kind of place. I love an industrial environment like that. So that's a brand new plating line. Um, I did some work there, not all of that, but I did some of the work there. And it's good to see a compliant plating line uh, go in. Uh, plating lines are very high polluters if they're not done right. But the modern plating lines are uh, compliant with all the emission standards. All right, next up is uh, right after the bash, I had a boatload of apricots. My tree outside, I feed it pure horse manure and it just exploded. Take a look. So what do I do with a tree full of apricots? And I'm literally pulling a five gallon bucket of apricots off that tree every day for about a week and a half or two. So what do I do with all these apricots? You know, my wife took one look at it, she said, I'm not canning all that. So I, I did something with it myself and it involved uh, a bunch of sugar and some yeast. So after it aged a while and I racked it a few times and clarified it a little bit and uh, I had to kind of back sweeten it, the yeast chewed through all that sugar like you wouldn't believe so it ended up uh, real dry so I had to kind of back sweeten it and you know we kind of took some with us to the to the fest, we go to the land fest and everyone seemed to like it so uh, and I got quite a bit more of it. But that's what I did with my apricots. Uh, my first attempt, uh, I guess it was, it was a success. Next up, um, list of cabinets. You know, I've been on the prowl for some for quite a while. And I uh, first found this little one on Craigslist. Mm. 
that was not a genuine Lista. That was called an Equip Right, uh, and it was branded with the Fastenal brand. I guess that's what they use in the Fastenal stores. So pretty cool. Uh, good storage. It's never enough. So I found another one not even a week later. And this big dog was a store and lock. So I went through that one and uh, they got 10 rollers per drawer. And, and that thing has, I think, 11 or 12 drawers. And someone had lubricated them with motorcycle chain lube, which is kind of waxy. And it felt like a bar of soap and they were gummy and sticky. And then I went to a lot of trouble to clean that out. But uh, that second cabinet made a huge difference. It's not even completely full yet. Um, but I, uh, I do enjoy those Lista knockoffs. The second one was a store and lock, not a genuine Lista either, but it functions and operates just like a Lista. All right. Uh, next up, I, f I had a Franken cobble, uh, my shop press. I was running on a bottle jack type, type press and I made my own frame. So, uh, let's take a look at what I put together off of another unit. Now that, that took a 20 ton ram and that was the air over hydraulic uh, pump uh, from Temco. So I had less than $200 into it between the ram, the power unit, and then that head uh, was given to me by Mr. Greg France. And I franken cobbled a, uh, a, a pretty good press. I'm real happy with how it turned out and it operates really nice. Good action, plenty of power, love it. So uh, thanks to everyone that donated and uh, pretty happy with the uh, Temco hydraulics. Uh, next up, uh, people ask me, what else can you do in a hot shop besides just heat treat stuff? I use it for burn off. Uh, let's go over to the sink and see what I'm doing to clean parts. Okay, so I got you parked over the sink and uh, I've got some parts here. These are some uh, rotators that I repair. Some of you guys uh, remember some of my, one of my other videos, but, uh, they come in and there's the oiling hole right there, little tiny hole right there where they put a hypodermic needle in there and grease it. So they're loaded with grease. They're loaded with paint. These are on a paint line and this is the rotating part here, but this is put in with a green uh, thread locker, which is a stud lock. And I throw these in a, in a hot shot for 900 degrees for three hours. All the grease gets burned out of them, so when I open this thing up, it's going to be clean. And I'll show you something else. Burns the Loctite out, so that stud just just comes out. It's it's done, and there is not a single sign of Loctite on that stud at all. And then here, I'll show you something else. You just take them over to the sink, and all the the uh, the white paint is from the customer, but the red paint is uh, uh, red oxide primer from us. You just give them a little scrub down with a Scotch Brite. And this is the quickest, easiest way to clean parts. You can see that red oxide just, just kind of washing away. So that dude is clean and ready to take apart in service. It still feels a little rough. There's a bunch of charred, there's going to be a bunch of charred grease inside, but it's not going to be a big blobby mess. I don't have to get my hands too messy when I'm doing it. So uh, pretty good. This one, the uh, stud already came out. So uh, cleaning quick and easy with a little bit of a little bit of heat. Don't go overboard. You know, 900 degrees is fine. Eight, eight, 900, whatever it takes to destroy the paint and uh, kind of char it up. You know, you can see where all the grease and everything kind of puked out of there and burned. Right there is a little kind of a run out mark from that rotator inside. So. The, Give them a good rinse, give them a blowout, and then you can get them over on the leg. Here's another one. This is a, uh, here's your rotator down here. Here's your stud here that had the thread locker. Look at that. Just unscrews by hand. Don't even have to fight it or try to melt it out of there or whatever, but the, the hot shot will take care of it for you. If it'll fit in the oven, it'll work.
There you go. 900 degrees, three hours. So that's what I use my hot shot for besides heat treating. You know, you can do burn off on powder, paint, grease, oil, things like that. And uh, makes them much easier to clean. Just take them over to the sink and kind of scrub, give them a little scrub and rinse them off. And you're not sanding and grinding and doing all these things. So uh, that's another use for the hot shot. Uh, next up, we made, we took a trip to Rockland, California, which is way up north, uh, up by Sacramento. And we had a paint line to go in there. Or there was an existing paint line, excuse me. And they were adding a, a collection unit. So we were, uh, I took a little video of it. And this is in an old Ace Hardware distribution center. And the, the roof on this building is massive. They got a drop T-bar ceiling, but beyond that, it's it's... 36 feet to the deck. So quite extensive getting this thing in there. The ductwork was all of it. Let's go take a look. Okay, so we were up there uh, five working days. We got that thing in. Like I said, the ductwork was all the work. The collector was just nothing, you know. But we worked it upside down. Uh, that had to go top down. We had to put the ductwork in first and then put the collector in underneath it. Uh, so kind of working backwards there, but sometimes you have to do that. Uh, next up, I got a new helper in the shop, my darling daughter. And she is learning to TIG well. So pretty cool that she has interest in that. She's got her own welding hood now, and she comes over and kind of crams on the TIG welder whenever she can. Uh, she's got a pretty steady hand, better than mine, and she's doing good. Uh, also, in addition to that, she just graduated from the fire academy. So proud father. Now I'm the, uh, the father of a paramedic she passed her nationals so she's good anywhere in the united states to work so pretty proud of her and uh she's got a, she got a good road ahead of her uh next up was uh we did a job where we had to drill and tap straight but you know by the final we were we were a good 60 80 feet in the air so uh that kind of drives home the point that you don't always have a milling machine around to drill and tap straight uh, big Gator to the rescue. Let's go have a look. So we had to put threaded studs in a in a building in the purlins of a building. Uh, those were quarter inch thick, uh, big C channels, 
and we had to get the drill and tap straight and easily done just a clamp and the big gator uh, tapping and drilling blocks and we got it done uh, next up uh, door limit switches you know the price of explosion proof door limit switches is getting pretty high so we were looking for an alternative and um, if you go with the air powered switch uh, they're a fraction of the price and they're intrinsically safe all they're operating on is pneumatics now this system uses a uh, a very small Ingersoll Rand uh, door limit switch, pneumatic, and then it goes off to a pressure transducer in the uh, in the control panel that will trigger an electrical signal. So let's go have a peek at uh, a pneumatic limit control system. Okay, so that's uh, that's a that's the bar Z way of getting around having to do door limit switches. Functions the same when you open a door; it's dropping out an electrical circuit. Um, but we don't have to do. Not only do we not have to buy the expensive explosion proof switches, we don't have to wire them either. Just run a little bit of polyethylene tubing and call it a day. So this is a way to get around the intrinsically or to get an intrinsically safe system in and uh, get around the explosion proof switches. Uh, next up, someone was talking about the, a bridge port uh, slotting or shaping head uh, that they had got, and they were looking for tooling. Now, I made my own, and uh, here, let's take take a look at the photographs of, of, of my tool that I use uh, with my bridge port slotting head. Okay, now that particular tool holds your tool bit at a three degree angle, so you've already got automatic clearance built into it, and the three different pieces that bolt on will offer a quarter inch, three eighths, and half inch tool bits. We'll plug in there, and then you just grind the width of your tool to whatever you need. If you've got a metric keyway or something funny to cut, uh, you can grind your own tools and they'll drop right in there. So um, that's the most universal way I figured out how to do it. I didn't have any tooling either when I got my shaping head or slotting head. So uh, that's my answer to it there. Next up is a, a ladder modification we had to do for a job. There was a, a pretty nice access ladder that got sent to a job, but it was too wide and it was powder coated. So I'm, I'm wondering where, what do I do with it? How do I, where do I cut it? And I don't want to, you know, be messing, welding with powder coat socks anyways. So where do I where do I cut this thing to narrow this ladder? And we had to modify the handrail and stuff. What what do we do? Uh, so we we finally decided to cut it right down the middle, right on the rungs. Here it is in the back of my truck. So we took six inches out of the ladder in the center to narrow it up, and then uh, after we were done, you know, we polished all the uh, the powder coat off, welded it, and then just touched it up with regular you know, rattle can, an aerosol can, and you could hardly even tell we did anything, but we didn't have to weld next to the main uh, square tube and ruin the finish. So uh, this is how it turned out. Okay, so we got that back in and, uh, you know, we we touched it up right up the center rails. Customer's happy. We didn't spoil the powder coat on the main, on the sides where the main box tube is. So uh, everyone's happy with it, with the modification at least, and we didn't have to send it back out for powder coat. More important. All right, so uh, that's that's a kind of a field modification that we had to do. Um, next up was a, a little tip I showed on Instagram 
I had a, uh, a knurled knob that was stuck and I needed to put a pair of pliers on it, but I didn't want to spoil the knurling. And so I did it. So plastic tie wrap works just fine. Uh, cushions your knurl, gives you a little bit of grip, throw a pair of vice grips or channel locks on there and get your knurled knob off without, uh, without damaging it. Well, next up was my trip to the Good Old Land Fest 2019. Uh, we went out there early to help Justin out, and I was going to meet uh, Ray over in uh, Austin, Texas. But there was a big storm coming in, so uh, right about the New Mexico border, right over El Paso, uh, we started passing over the storm, and I took a little bit of video out of the window of the plane. Let's take a, take a look at the size of this storm. And then my first hop was to Dallas, so it, it was just socked in the whole way and that continuous layer of uh, uh, cloud cover there. And um, when I got to Dallas, it was already raining. As soon as we got underneath that, it was coming down pretty good. So my first day was quite a bit of rain. Uh, met up with Ray in Austin after I took a little 20-minute uh, plane ride down to Austin, so I did catch up with Ray. Look at the size of the head on that thing. Did I ever and then from there, we went straight over to uh, Joe Pizinski's place, uh, Advanced Innovations in uh, Liberty Hill, Texas, I believe. And we got to spend a little bit of time with him, threw a few back. Ray got to stand in front of his whiteboard and cut up a little bit. Innovations. Start over. <laughs> Welcome back to Advanced Innovations. One, go. Hey, Ray's Garage here. Welcome back to Advanced Innovations. Thanks for having us, Joe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got to go around his place and look at some of his machines, talk shop, have a good time. Just, just a nice relaxing time. And I thank Joe for his hospitality. So we got to our hotel that night, uh, up from Joe's place, and we got up to uh, Temple, Texas, where we we're gonna, uh, where our hotel and all our arrangements were already made. So we got up there, and uh, pretty late we got in, crashed. Got up early the next day and headed over to the Good Little Land Fest. Um, I hooked up with uh, Clark uh, Easterling. He was doing his first firing of his uh, smelting pot or forge. And it's, this is a video while it's still cold. Now, the forge hasn't reached flash temperature of the diesel oil. So he, he fires first with propane to get it going. After the refractory's up over the flash point of the diesel, then it'll run on diesel. But it's still running kind of rich here. And I, here's a little video shot of it just starting to lean out and just starting to fire right. And it kind of sounds like a jet engine and you get that dragon's breath out of the top. So it's a, it's a pretty cool Unity made. Let's go check it out. Okay, so pretty cool unit reasonably portable um you know he's got it so it runs like i said it runs on diesel oil and uh you just gotta initially fire it on on probe to get it going but uh pretty good uh pretty good rig he's got there and uh, let's go take a look at the anvils uh that he casts these are made out of cast iron okay we're here with clark from windy hill foundry hello y'all say hey clark and there he's made are. his first successful pour 
with cast iron today. Yeah. And we broke the gate off right here. Here's uh -huh. what the here's what the other ones look like before we snapped them off. And so we've got three successful pours. Um, out, out, off of, oh, there you go. So we do have the pattern there. Sorry, my hands are getting dirty. I'm, I'll try not to pollute it. So he's got that. And I think what we're going to do, we're going to have Clark snap off the gates. We might just run it over to that little milling machine over there and try to give that a flat top and a flat bottom, and that'll make a nice little paperweight for somebody. That'll give Quinn something to do. Yeah, absolutely. We'll give Quinn or uh, either that or Steve Barton something to do. Yeah. I think they got a carbide milling cutter over there. They'll get, they'll plow through that like it won't even know it's there. Well, these definitely didn't have enough time to set in the sand, so I pulled them within you, an hour and a half after pouring. So you pulled yeah. them and quenched them. Yeah. So, so they're hard. They're hard. Okay. They're hard. Surprisingly, they didn't steam when I dipped them in the in the bucket. Though. Okay. So we may be we may be good. Looking at this gate, you can see some gray iron. Touches a gray in the middle there. Yep. So they may be good. Okay. They may be just fine. So we'll see. All right. Awesome. Okay, Clark. Well, thanks for showing me around. Uh, yep. If you want to snap those gates off, we'll go over and. Uh, Play on the milling machine a little bit and see what we can make out of those. Right. We're gonna grind the, the grind them as close as you can. Yeah, grind them as close as you can. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get them in the mill from there. No worries. Thank you. So Clark did pretty well with his cast iron. Uh, had a good time with him. He's got a very dry sense of humor. Didn't even really see that coming. But uh, uh, he's a he's a contender. I'm uh, I'm pretty sarcastic and dry as well. So uh, gotta love Clark and his wife. Josie's pretty cool. All right, uh, next up at the fest, uh, let's take a look, uh, or let's go check in with Quinn from Blondie Hacks. She was doing demonstrations on a little milling machine that came in from Precision Matthews. Uh, a lot of people got to kind of get in close, see what was going on with the mill, how to set it up for the first time. So let's go, let's go have a look. <laughs> Okay, so pretty cool. Uh, Quinn got to, you know, meet a lot of her viewers and, got, you know, a lot of these guys get to get in close and really see what a milling machine is all about and what to expect when they get their milling machine for the first time and what they're going to need and what, you know, just how to set it up. And then this, that kind of information is invaluable. Uh, next up was a very large power plant at the event that they fired. Uh, this was the day before the event. I got to see this thing running. Uh, pretty cool. That's uh, quite the impressive power plant. I think they used to run a generator off of that to power up some industrial buildings, whatever. But uh, there was an old generator there, hook, kind of hooked up to that um, as a you know just an example. It didn't have the the drive shaft in there, but uh, it didn't look like the generator was functioning. But you could kind of see the generator housing there. So pretty cool to see those old machines running. Uh, next up was a couple of group shots we did, just kind of gathered everyone up, which it's very difficult to get everyone together in one spot, even for a picture, but we did manage to do it.
And then here's a picture of registration after we uh, kind of started getting it set up and uh, we didn't really know where to put it, but we kind of had a pretty good idea. I just kind of ran down there in a golf cart and did it. So uh, registration is set up and we're ready for the main event. And as far as the event goes, I didn't really tip. This is what you just saw is all the video and pictures I've got, which is hardly anything. I spent most of my time doing uh, live feeds. Um, we didn't really have any way to stay in touch with the people in the outside world. It's kind of Instagram and Facebook little little snippets. So I did some live feeds, uh, you know, from the event, and you know I wanted people on the outside to not only you know, be in touch, but I want you to see what you missed. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't come to this thing, you blew it. Uh, real good time and uh, make sure you sign up next year and get there. If you have the means, get there any way you can. Um, but my live feeds, not necessarily good, you know, but uh, you, you got to kind of wander around and with me a little bit and see what's going on and talk to a few people. Uh, a few people told me that live feeds don't do your channel any good which I don't think they do. And a lot of guys said live feeds actually hurt your channel. Um, I'm not that particular about my channel. I don't really care that much. So I don't, I don't mind it hurting my channel. So uh, I, I don't, I'm not a full-time YouTuber, but uh, enjoy myself. Uh, if you want to go back, check out the live feeds. They're all, uh, they're all labeled uh, good of the land 2019. I think it was five or six of them up there. Just random live feeds, day before, day of, and the day after. All right, uh, last up, uh, we are on the last of the hot shots for 2019. We're going to build in November, and we're going to deliver um, before the end of the year. If you do call out and say, hey, these are Christmas presents, I'm going to make, um, those are going to get priority, and those are going to go out, and, and you're going to get those before Christmas. Um, but we've got uh, a batch of 20. I'm going to keep it limited to 20. Right now, about 16 are spoken for, so there's a little bit of room if you want to get your hands on a hot shot. Uh, 360, the 1200s are not available yet. Those are coming in spring 2020. Those are new for spring. I knew a few people that are already waiting for the uh, 1200s. Okay, uh, shoot me an email if you want to get on the list. Uh, everyone that was on my standby list, I've already emailed, so check your junk folder and see if you got an email from me. And if you want to get on the list, uh, uh, I've got about three that didn't respond to my last email. So uh, if you want to get in on the list, this is the last chance to get this year's pricing. Uh, they're going up in price in 2020. All right. Um, that was the episode of The Grind. I hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, thank you for helping me clear out my Dropbox. Uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.